Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the UC Ag Expert Talk on Managing Glyphosate-Resistant Weeds. I'm Stephanie Pereira with the UC Statewide IPM Program, and Cheryl Reynolds and Peter Cosina are also here with me, and they'll be running the polls and troubles troubleshooting any techn technical problems. Um, now I'd like to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Brad Hansen. Dr. Hansen is a Cooperative Extension Specialist in the Department of Plant Sciences at UC Davis, and today he will be talking about managing glyphosate-resistant weeds in orchard crops. And now I'd like to pass this over to Brad. Uh, Brad, you can go ahead and share your slides. Okay. Thanks, everybody. This is a, a, a new one on me. This is my first webinar, so I'm, I'm excited to talk to myself in my office. Um, we're going to talk today about managing glyphosate resistant weeds in orchard crops and I want to give some some general background about that and get into some specific issues of glyphosate resistant plants affecting the orchard and vineyard cropping system in California. Uh, before I do that, um, just a quick introduction for myself for those that don't know me. So I'm a, as Stephanie said, I'm a cooperative extension specialist at UC Davis in the Department of Plant Sciences. So I basically have a, a research and extension program focused mostly on herbicide issues in orchard and vineyard crops, herbicide performance, herbicide resistance, crop safety. Um, I have oversee the IR4 field program here at, at Davis and work around different uh, uh, chemical pest management issues. I also work to some degree in some annual crops like tomatoes um, and, and am involved in a number of other uh, herbicide and weed control systems in California. My, my team and I, my program and I, I should say. This is not a, not a one-man show. Before we get started in glyphosate resistance, I think it's really useful to think about pesticide resistance more broadly, uh, mostly because some people forget or, or are not aware that uh, resistance to pesticides is not unique to herbicides. That's been certainly in the news a lot and on a lot of our, as weed managers, that's certainly on our mind. But uh, we've had resistance to other classes of chemicals for over a hundred years. Uh, insecticide resistance reported in the early 1900s, fungicide resistance in the 40s, uh, warfarin resistant uh, rats in the, in the, during the 1950s, and herbicide resistant weeds were first reported in 1957. Uh, that first case was a, a case of spreading dayflower in Hawaii resistant to 2,4-D. Our first reported case of herbicide resistant weeds in California was reported in 1981 and that was an atrazine resistant biotype of common groundsel uh, from an asparagus production system. <clears throat> I'd like to just to make sure we're all on the same page. I want to give two kind of brief definitions here, uh, comparing the difference between herbicide tolerance and herbicide resistance. Herbicide tolerance are those species that have the inherent ability to survive the the pesticide, the herbicide in question. Um, these are the ones that have never been able to be controlled by by that herbicide. Herbicide resistance, on the other hand, today's topic is the inherited ability of a plant to survive um, and reproduce following exposure to a dose of that herbicide that would normally be lethal to the, the wild type or the, the regular biotype. Uh, just my, my made up quote there says, these are the plants that we used to be able to control with this herbicide, but it just doesn't work as well anymore. So it implies something has changed that it uh, allows it to survive. Another issue I'd like to hit on before we really get going in this is thinking about the causes of resistance. So pesticides or herbicides in particular do not technically cause resistance. They don't cause a change in the plant that, that uh, allows them to survive. Plants, are, uh, weeds especially, are tremendously variable in terms of their genetic diversity. So there's, there's a lot of random um, mutations, random traits that occur in within a, a wide range in population. In a few cases, some of those allow a plant to survive a herbicide. Uh, the second or the third bullet point there, there are a, a very few cases of escape of herbicide resistant traits from crops to weeds, but that's by far the minority. Mostly uh, our herbicide resistant weeds are selected for with, with herbicides. They're, they're pre-existing uh, infrequent individuals that are selected against. Uh, 
And this essentially is kind of a real life example of, of Darwinism, uh, survival of the fittest. In this case, the ability to survive the herbicide certainly imparts a fitness uh, benefit to the plant and allows it to grow as a proportion of the population. Just to think about this in terms of a cartoon, um, you can see in the upper left, if we're thinking about a population with a really rare individual, that's that black cartoon plant in the center of the image. When we apply an effective herbicide and we kill all, all or most of the other individuals, that rare individual now is, is one of the few that's going to be able to set seed. So over, over years, let me see. I'm not sure if you guys can see my arrow or not. In the middle left-hand panel, the next year, for example, that uh, biotype or that portion of the population able to survive increases in frequency. Again, you apply that selection pressure. Now there's more individuals that set seed and again and again over time. So it's really the selection pressure is creating shifting populations from the sensitive biotype to a, to a resistant biotype that may have started with a single individual several, several generations ago. It's important also to note that the selection pressure can vary quite dramatically among systems, um, cropping practices, uh, herbicides, and different weeds as well are more prone to, uh, well, basically having broader genetic variability. Um, just to give a, a little bit of example here, if you have a cropping practice that has very little herbicide rotation, very little crop rotation, and you use repeatedly the same selection, uh, same uh, chemistry, you'll have a much higher selection pressure than if you have uh, more diverse crop rotations or more diverse weed management tactics. <clears throat> Likewise, from a herbicide standpoint, the <laughs> Excuse me. The greatest selection pressure will obviously come from the most effective herbicides. If you typically get 99.9% .9 weed control, that's a great deal of selection pressure for that rare individual. If you have a herbicide that's much much less effective, 20%, 30%, 50%, that's a much lower degree of selection pressure. And and again, some weeds are, have uh, inherently more uh, genetic diversity within a population or among populations. Cheryl's going to bring that poll question up. And so the poll question is, which of these weed control tactics impose selection pressure on weeds in orchards? Uh, Brad, you can okay. take it away. Sure. So th this was sort of a trick question, honestly. The, um, so the plurality here, most people know or believe that post-emergent herbicides impose um, uh, selection pressure. Uh, quite a few people think pre-emergence do, and um, a lesser degree tillage and organic herbicides. And realistically, all of these practices impose some kind of selection pressure. Um, the chemical weed control practices, obviously, the post-emergence, such as glyphosate, which we're talking about today, but pre-emergent herbicides also can impose selection pressure in a slightly different manner in that they can select against several cohorts of weed, uh, it, weeds that are emerging or, or germinating in a field. Um, organic herbicides are similar. Uh, they they can impose selection pressure as well, um, and and tillage in the same in the same manner. The tillage, for example, could impose selection. Probably, I would say this is not so much selecting for resistance as it is selecting for um, perhaps early or later uh, germinating biotypes or earlier or later germinating and emerging species. So we might see a species shift, but all of these practices can impose some sort of selection pressure on weed populations. Okay, so where do, where do we stand on herbicide resistance? As I, as I said a, a moment ago, this is a pretty big issue in, in the world. Uh, there's actually these these data are from Dr. Ian Heap's uh, website, weedscience.org, which is sort of a clearinghouse for herbicide resistance uh, reported cases in in the world. Um, this is probably a little bit out of date and probably an underestimate uh, realistically. Um, but at this point, um, Dr. Heap uh, reported almost five hundred individual uh, mode of action uh, species combinations. And the reason this is probably an underreport is, you know, if there's been several cases of resistance reported to uh, glyphosate resistant ryegrass, for example, if, if you're the 10th or 20th case uh, reported, you may not bother to put it on this website. So a lot of these have increased in 
um, you know, spread or a number of locations where those cases are found. The, the early and initial reports get a lot more interest among the scientific community than the, than the later reports. But it's been a very much a steep increase since the mid 70s when I, I would say this co coincides with some of our more effective herbicide uh, development. In the mid 70s, this would have been the triazines and some of that type of herbicide chemistry. Did we do this poll question? Yes. So Cheryl will bring up the next okay. poll question. Thank you. Thank now. you. And the question is, glyphosate resistance is the only known herbicide resistance in weedy species. True or false? That's probably good. So you're all listening since I gave it away before we pulled up the poll. But yeah, that's absolutely right. The, they're, they're, we're talking about glyphosate resistance here, and that's probably the most important problem we have in orchards and vineyards, but it's far from the only case of resistance, cases of resistance. Um, which brings me to this slide. So that that last slide showed the linear increase um, on all cases of resistance. This slide is from the same source from Dr. Heap's site, uh, breaking it down by several different herbicide mode of action groups. Uh, in this case, for example, this this red line, the ALS inhibitors, this would be products like the sulfonylureas and the imidazlinone herbicides. In trees and vines, we'd be thinking about uh, rim sulfuron, flaza sulfuron, that like the matrix and mission type products, the panoxalum part of Pindar GT would be in this category. This darker blue line, the group five herbicides, that's the photosystem two inhibitors, things like simazine, uh, diuron, that type of chemistry that's been around since the 60s. So you see these, uh, often you see this sort of lag where shortly after the, the herbicides are introduced, you know, and, and become widely adopted. Um, triazines and uh, photosystem two inhibitors in, uh, first developed in the late 50s through the 60s, started to see widespread resistance by the late 70s and early 80s. The uh, sulfonylurea is this red line, the ALS inhibitors, developed in the 80s, uh, became very, very important in the, the mid to late 80s and early 90s with a concurrent uh, increase in selection pressure and number of acres selected, uh, and so on down the line. Uh, the, the group nine herbicides, this lighter blue line, that's the EPSPS synthase inhibitors. Basically, that's glyphosate is the only uh, registered um, uh, active ingredient in that group. And you can see since the mid 1990s, um, we've had somewhere around 40 different biotypes um, reported with resistance to glyphosate. Uh, which is kind of interesting to me because uh, glyphosate has been a registered herbicide since 1974. So uh, re realistically, this selection pressure ramped up considerably after the advent of Roundup Ready cropping systems, which were first uh, marketed in 1996. So how do herbicides, how do weeds become resistant to herbicides? Well, in a, in a nutshell or in a, in a couple of broad categories, I'll talk about target site resistance, a couple of different uh, types of target site resistance, and also a suite of non-target site resistant mechanisms of resistance. And I'll hit each of these in turn, but uh, we'll talk briefly about modifications um, at the herbicide binding site. This is typically uh, caused by a single base pair mutation, something that slightly changes one of these uh, Gs and Cs and Ts and As in a, in a uh, strand of DNA so that it changes the shape of that protein or, or the enzyme. There's a couple of different important non-target site mechanisms. These could be enhanced metabolism, which is essentially something that facilitates a rapid, uh, uh, unexpectedly rapid degradation of the herbicide. It could be a, a mutation or a change that, cha that affects how the herbicide moves in the plant, that's reduced translocation. Uh, potentially sequestration, which is kind of a compartmentalization of the herbicide, um, and potentially increasing the amount of the target enzyme. And we'll talk about each of those. From a very simple standpoint, um, the, a lot of us think about herbicide resistance at the target site as a, as a three-dimensional change in that enzyme. Uh, and I like this sort of cartoon uh, version of an enzyme. That's that, that yellow molecule in the middle. Generally what happens with, with an enzyme function is to take a, a substrate and turn it into a product. And it just does that over and over again. And what can happen is, some minor change in the uh, DNA um, can change the way that enzyme forms. Essentially, the proteins are folded up um, 
they, they fold in, in a very specific way based on the uh, base pairs. And if you have a change in a specific location that, that, that can affect the three-dimensional change of that enzyme such that perhaps the substrate, well, for example here, if the herbicide, that green molecule, binds on that enzyme and blocks the substrate from doing, you know, being uh, um, grabbed a hold of by the enzyme, um, it would it would cease to be functional. Um, if you get a a change, as as illustrated here in this lower right, where this little the binding pocket for the herbicide is changed, the substrate may still be able to function, which would make, but the herbicide can no longer bind and inhibit that activity. If that happens, the enzyme continues to do its its job. It's, it goes through its biochemical processes in spite of the presence of the herbicide because the herbicide has nowhere to bind. This is this is a, a photo of some actual um, dose response data and and a, a generalized dose response relationship of what we often see with target site resistance. Usually, target site resistance imparts a quite high level of resistance. Uh, this is a little mustard relative called small seed false flax, uh, some work I did a number of years ago uh, that were resistant to the sulfonylurea herbicides. The use rate for that herbicide would be somewhere probably around 14 grams per hectare. Um, and you can see here uh, the upper, the resistant biotype survived even at 1,000 grams, which was you know more than Oh, 20 times higher than the registered use rate, whereas the uh, sensitive biotype was obviously very, very sensitive at 20 times less than the normal use rate was still still damaged. That's very common when we see target site resistance. Essentially, in many cases, it's almost immunity because that that enzyme is cannot be affected by the the herbicide inhibitor. The next case I wanted to talk about is enhanced metabolism. This can this is usually seen as as some sort of upregulation of some kind of enzymatic pathway in the plant that detoxifies you know, toxic compounds in the plant, and in some cases that can also include herbicides. These some of these can be fairly specific. A couple of examples like the aryl um, acylamidases that detoxify propanil and jungle rice. It is very very specific to that herbicide and is one of the reasons. Well, actually, in that particular case, that aryl acylamidase is, is why prop, excuse me, rice has that same um, pathway, which is why rice is tolerant of propanil. There's biotypes of jungle rice that are have an enhanced ability that basically the upregulation of that pathway to impart resistance to propanil. Another example would be glutathione S transferases that can very, very rapidly detoxify atrazine in velvet leaf and some other plants. These metabolic pathways can also be more general. The two that I just presented were very specific to those herbicides. Um, a more general pathway would be upregulating of the cytochrome P450 monooxygenase system. These are broad, well, these are, there's a lot of different monooxygenases that can, uh, this family of enzymes can detoxify a lot of different xenobiotic uh, compounds in plants and animals. Um, and, and can catalyze a lot of different reactions that could differentially affect uh, different herbicides. And I won't go into the biochemistry. This is a, a, a little illustration showing kind of a generalized path, a uh, uh, type that, of resistance or, or phenotype that you might see with metabolism-based resistance. Oftentimes, it's much less dramatic resistance compared to the target site. You can see here, this is a, uh, a bleaching herbicide. This is norfluorazon resistant annual uh, annual bluegrass work I did uh, many years ago. And you can see here the, the RS ratios, which is basically the, the uh, ratio of GR50s of the S population to GR50s of the R population. And this is where we see sort of three, four, maybe five fold levels of resistance. So it's, it's often much less dramatic than we see with the target site where we could see orders of magnitude levels of resistance. Another non-target site type of resistance is decreased translocation. So with a, particularly with a translocated herbicide like glyphosate, for that herbicide to have an effect, it has to get to the, the spot in the plant. You know, it has to get into the cell and has to get to the uh, intercellular um, uh, compartment where the target site is located. So if anything occurs that changes the ability 
of that herbicide to move in the plant, um, you know, something that affects herbicide transport either into the symplast or into the specific compartment, that can actually affect dramatically the, the herbicide. And we sometimes see this in research projects where we'll see resistance at the whole plant level, you know, when we spray the plant with a herbicide, but when we extract the enzyme and do, you know, laboratory test, the, her the enzyme in that biotype can be affected by the herbicide. It's just that at the whole plant level, it's, it doesn't get a sufficient amount of the herbicide in the right place at the right time to be toxic. Sequestration is a, is a, is a sort of a form of that last one, honestly. Uh, this is basically where the herbicide is put away somewhere. It's tied up in some way so that it can't be translocated. So it's not specifically affecting tr the process of translocation, but it's affecting the availability of the herbicide to be translocated. Uh, this could be something very simple like uh, high partitioning into waxes. This is one of the reasons why very lipophilic herbicides often don't have uh, foliar activity because they just can't get past the waxy cuticle. That's not a mutation, but that's a reason. Uh, uh, it's a sequestration process. Uh, another more common one would be storage in the vacuole or some other organelle in the cell. And this is one we see often with uh, a herbicide like Paraquat. Uh, is often um, the, where we have paraquat resistance, they, they're typically still active if they can get to the to this, uh, photosynthetic apparatus, but it's uh, very quickly compartmentalized in, into a, a place where it can't cause any damage in the cell. Okay, and uh, sort of two related other types of, of uh, non-target mechanisms of resistance is gene, <clears throat> I could, I'm sorry, I misspoke there. These are all target site. These are, these are different um, ways that the herbicide is not able to uh, affect the target site. These next two are, are basically creating more target site. So if we have, uh, say, a change in the gene regulation such that a lot more of the target site is created, or there's more copies of that gene also resulting in more, more copies of the target site, that can impart resistance in certain cases. Um, this has been pretty widely reported with the glyphosate resistant Palmer amaranth. A normal Palmer amaranth would have one copy of the EPSPS target site. That's the, the target site for glyphosate. Um, researchers around the country and around the world have found some populations or some biotypes of Palmer amaranth that have hundreds of copies. So individually, those enzymes are still affected by glyphosate. There's just not enough uh, there's just so many of them that that they that the herbicide doesn't inhibit all of the the enzyme, and they're still able to create enough of the target site so that the biosynthetic processes are able to continue. Um, some of these have a real clear correlation between the number of copies and the level of resistance. Others not so clear. Um, and then that last point. This is really an interesting uh, bit of research going on currently in that this, this is uh, much more complicated in polyploid species. So diploid species only have one copy. So if you have two or 10 or 100 copies, you see a linear increase. Polyploids have multiple copies already, but those aren't always equally active. And so we can see some kind of interesting patterns in terms of the level of resistance uh, as related to the number of copies. Could we pull up the next poll question, please? Okay, Cheryl's bringing that up now. Okay, so the question is, herbicide resistance can be caused by which of these? The altered target site, enhanced metabolism, gene overexpression or multiple copies of the target enzyme, all of the, or all of the above? Okay, I think most people got that got that right. All of the above can be mechanisms of herbicide resistance. I think it's important to note though um, that that's not, we don't always see all of these cases in every, every type of resistance or every, um, every case of resistance. But thinking about herbicide resistance more broadly, all of these can do that and have been reported to do that some, in some species somewhere with, with, with some herbicide weed uh, interaction. Okay, so how do we mitigate resistance? So here I've got TSR as target site resistance. So generally target site resistance is a, a fairly high level of resistance and it's 
generally quite consistent because you've got some genetic change in the target site or the ability of the herbicide to get to the target site. Um, the, this type of resistance tends to be favored by high herbicide rates. So our, our typical management recommendation is to alternate or, or use a tank mix with multiple herbicide modes of action with overlapping weeds, uh, weed control spectrums. So basically with this high level, with target site resistance, increasing the rate usually is not gonna be sufficient to give you control. If you'll remember that, um, that little mustard plant I showed you where a thousand, you know, almost 20 times higher than a normal rate, still those plants didn't uh, show any ill effects. So within our labeled rates, this is not typically uh, gonna be a solution for managing target site resistance. So mitigation of non-target site resistance, NTSR. So many, many times non-target site resistance is uh, typified, I would say, by a low to sort of moderate level of resistance. And in many cases, this can be quite variable among growing stages of the plant or among different environments and can be a lot harder to um, troubleshoot, especially at the early stages. Uh, many, many cases of non-target site resistance or multifactorial resistance where it's got several small uh, contributing factors can, can create, um, well, there can be interchange of these genes and kind of accumulation of minor genes through re uh, hybridization if it's an outcrossing species or, or you know, different genetic processes. This type of resistance is, is thought to be favored by low herbicide rates. So you, you don't have a really high level of resistance. So if you use a, a high labeled rate or you know the top of the label rate, you might still get control. Conversely, if you use cut rates or you know below label rates, you may actually start to shift and accumulate these low levels of resistance. Uh, some people call this creeping resistance. And this is often, um, should ring a, an alarm bell, but often is missed, especially at the early stages. So managing non-target site resistance um, usually boils down to using full label rates. So, so don't shave the rates. This helps eliminate those moderately resistant individuals. It also helps, um, well, and, and you should do follow-up um, management, either you know, additional treatments or hand roguing or other types of weed control to, to catch those escapes, the, the survivors, because this helps eliminate both target site resistant individuals and any non-target site resistant survivors. I think as an applicator, as a weed manager, it's also really important to make sure you avoid sublethal doses. Um, that could be because of poor applications, like it was too late and the plants were too big. It could be because of uh, reduced rate programs. Uh, for years, there were recommendations to do chemical mowing. These were sublethal rates of glyphosate to stunt grasses but not kill them. That's probably been a major contributor to some of our uh, glyphosate resistant grass problems in California. Uh, poor sprayer calibration can lead to sublethal rates. Um, so I think this, this boils down to, you know, using really integrated practices to not just depend on single chemistries, not depend only on single practices, but try to integrate multiple practices and good field scouting to minimize um, both target site and non-target site resistance. So where do we stand in terms of orchard resistance issues? Um, glyphosate resistance is, is the, the subject of today's presentation and also the most important problem we have in orchards at this point. But we do have resistance to other herbicide modes of action in the orchard system. And probably more concerningly, we're getting a, a number of cases of multiple resistance where we've got populations of, of a, a weed that can survive, usually glyphosate and some other, popu uh, some other uh, commonly used herbicide. So how did we get here? So I pulled these data together the other day, just thinking about herbicides we use in the tree nut sector. So, the, so these data are combined for uh, almond, pistachio, and walnut uh, during 2016. This was the, the last, the most uh, recent year available on the uh, DPR database. And if you look at any of the other tree crops, the pattern looks very similar to this, whether they're stone fruit or palm fruit or anything else. We use a lot of glyphosate, 2.2 uh, million treated acres um, in 2016. That would be on a roughly two and a half million orchard acres. Um, and, but thinking about the way we treat orchards with our strip treatments, that probably means those strips were treated two to two and a half times a year with glyphosate on average statewide. 
the number two herbicide in this list is oxiflorophen. That's used at about half the total treated acres um, of glyphosate. And then you can see on down the list, Paraquat is about half of that. And then we're, we're starting to see a few more modes of action like, like saflufenacil is a PPO inhibitor. We're seeing more glufosinate. But um, as I think about these top five herbicides, four of the five of these are post-emergent herbicides only. Uh, oxiflorophen has both post-emergent and, and pre-emergent activity. So we're using a lot of post-herbicides because of our tank mix programs in uh, tree nut orchards. So as a result of that pattern, we have a lot of glyphosate resistant species in the state. Um, the more common ones you can see on the left-hand column here, the confirmed and, and widely understood or widely known uh, species include things like horseweed or mare's tail is another common name. Uh, hairy fleabane, palmer amaranth is, is a more recent reported species. And, and then in, in the grasses, uh, annual ryegrass or Italian ryegrass is very common um, throughout the Sacramento and San Joaquin Valley. I've seen quite a few num uh, populations and reports of annual bluegrass resistance to uh, glyphosate. And uh, in the last few years, I, we've done a lot of work on jungle rice. Something that's kind of interesting here, in each of these two groups, the horseweed and fleabane are mostly winter emerging plants or, or fall and, and winter, um, and ryegrass and bluegrass are similar, um, but the palmer amaranth and the jungle rice are summer, spe summer annual species, which presents a, a, a quite a different problem in terms of management. Um, on the right-hand column, I've got a list of suspected or questionable species. These are ones we've, we, I get a lot of questions about, um, but it's not as well understood. They can be variable. Um, control with glyphosate can be variable, um, and, and it's not been fully elucidated. But I'll just list here this, this uh, suite of summer grasses, spring and summer grasses, like three-spike goosegrass, the finger grasses, the sprangle tops, witch grass. We're getting more questions about these in California. And these genera, um, th these species are, are encompassed in these genera on the, on the lower uh, asterisk note here uh, with, that already have uh, reported glyphosate resistance at other places in the world. So it wouldn't be surprising to find them here as well. I'll just run through a, a little rogues gallery of, of those more important species. So the Caniza species or Erigeron is a, a, a genus name that's we're sort of transitioning that way. Hairy fleabane and horseweed can be very similar. You see in this upper right photo, that's a, a horseweed plant in the on the left and a fleabane plant on the right, and, and a little bit larger photos here. They're close relatives um, and, and have they can be very similar looking at the rosette stage. As they start to grow uh, size and, and bolt, we have um, the fleabane tends to be shorter and more profusely branched than horseweed and the life cycle is typically a little bit shorter, meaning it sets seed earlier in the season. Um, both of these have very widespread glyphosate resistance in, in the Central Valley and in the uh, coastal regions as well. Uh, Palmer amaranth, I mentioned that one. Um, this is a huge problem in other parts of the US, um, a, a lesser problem here in trees and vines, although we're seeing it uh, as a more common roadside weed and, and in some uh, Roundup Ready cropping systems. So this is a pigweed species. The amaranth species are, are pigweeds. Um, we're also seeing some more issues with another relative, uh, common water hemp, which, which can be easily confused. So, so thus far, I've seen this primarily in the San Joaquin Valley, and as I said a moment ago, on roadsides especially, but, but seeing to some degree in tree and vine crops like this raisin vineyard you can see in the lower right photo. The uh, ryegrass complex, the uh, Lolia multiflorum, or uh, Italian or annual ryegrass. This is a, probably the number one resistant species in the world um, to many modes of action. Uh, glyphosate resistant ryegrass is widespread in California. We've, been, we've known about this for more than 20 years. Um, we've had more recent reports of this species with resistance to uh, several other modes of action, including paraquat, uh, glufosinate, the ACCase inhibiting herbicides, and the ALS inhibiting herbicides, the sulfonyl ureas. So this is, I should be careful about my, my bullets here. So these other cases of resistance are not currently known to be widespread in trees and vines. Glyphosate resistance is very, very widespread in trees and vines. 
uh, we're seeing more issues with some of these other mode of action, particularly the ALS inhibitors and the ACCase inhibitors in cereal crops and some other systems. Jungle rice, this is a Echinocloa colona. It's a relative of barnyard grass and the water grasses that are important in rice cropping systems. We're hearing more and more cases of resistance in this species in uh, starting in the, the San Joaquin Valley, but, but certainly at multiple locations in the Sacramento Valley as well. Uh, mostly I've seen this in orchards and have had some reports in Roundup Ready cropping systems, especially Roundup Ready corn systems in the, the dairy production areas. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> a couple points about multiple resistance or the, the stacked resistance. Um, a number of these species, we've got very widespread glyphosate resistance. So growers automatically switch to using different modes of action and in some cases have selected for another resistance on top of the glyphosate resistance. Uh, the ones that, that I've been involved in research on have included hairy fleabane or the, the two caniza species, uh, the ryegrass and annual bluegrass, which is poa. Um, both of the photos on the on the right here, uh, hairy fleabane in the almond orchard on the top was um, treated with glyphosate and paraquat several times and you can see a, a really dense stand of hairy fleabane. The prune orchard on the lower right was is ryegrass that was also treated multiple times with, with uh, glyphosate and paraquat. Could we bring up the poll question please? And the question is, if a weed species is known to be resistant to glyphosate, that species is unlikely to be resistant to other post-emergence herbicides because glyphosate has a different mode of action. True or false? So this one is a little bit tricky. So you can get multiple resistance. So far in glyphosate, we've not seen a mechanism of resistance to glyphosate that also imparts resistant to other classes but we've seen resistance to glyphosate that also had another mechanism. So it's essentially two different mechanisms accumulated in the same, in the same plant or in the same biotype. So this can, be, this can be tricky. And it really can, it depends a bit on, on the mechanism of resistance and on the mode of action of, of the specific herbicide. Okay, I've got just a, a couple more species I wanted to make a couple of comments about. So I mentioned three spike goosegrass or the Eleusines. This is one we've seen quite a bit of uh, issues with growing in the last few years. Uh, the three spike is the, the panicle on the left versus the goosegrass, the Eleusine indica on the right. Just a, a couple of comments here. So the three spike goosegrass is a short-lived perennial, which is one reason it's a problem different than annual uh, than the uh, indica type goosegrass. It's very low growing, so it can actually avoid the, the mowing um, in many of the orchard middles. It's really tolerant of glyphosate, and I can't say that it's resistant because we don't have a susceptible to compare it to, so this may be inherent tolerance and, and spreading uh, more of a species shift. But it's even more tolerant as it gets some size to it. And the photos in the upper right here are just demonstrating that. This is the same uh, population treated at the, I think it was treated at about the three or four leaf stage and up to I think a 16x rate. Um, if you waited a few weeks and now they have six or eight tillers, they, they were almost, they had survival up at 16x. So just a few weeks difference with that species could make a really big di uh, difference in how effective the herbicide is. Uh, I mentioned this already, uh, other summer grasses, so I've gotten a number of questions about things like sprangle top, uh, witch grass, and feather finger grass. So these are summer grasses to be, be aware of um, if you're out there as a, a weed manager working in multiple cropping systems. Is that a poll question? Cheryl's bringing that up now. And the question is, which of these is a summer grass weed that is resistant to glyphosate in some areas of the Central Valley? Bermuda grass, hairy fleabane, yellow nut sedge, or jungle rice? All right, very good. Some you guys were listening. So jungle rice is the is the uh, major summer grass weed that's uh, pretty widely known to be resistant to uh, glyphosate in in California. Some of the others were trick questions. So yellow nut sedge, uh, we're not aware of glyphosate resistance. It's also not a grass. Uh, hairy fleabane is resistant, but it's it's not a grass, so that was to see if you were paying attention. 
and Bermuda grass is a tough, tough weed customer, but thus far we have not seen any glyphosate resistant uh, Bermuda grass in California, to my knowledge anyway. Okay, so how do we, how do we manage all these weeds? Really, it, it comes back to the basics. So monitoring and scouting fields to identify problems. And this is, weed ID is an important part of this. And if you've seen me present before, I, I generally make mention of this. Um, you, you need to know what problem you're trying to control so you can design good weed management uh, programs to control that, that weed or that, that species complex in your orchard. Uh, reducing weed seed production is really important. So we, if we have that rare individual, that might be resistant. We wanna make sure we get out there and control that individual before it produces dozens or hundreds or even thousands of seed that will be that founder population if it is a case of resistance. Using multiple herbicide modes of action, uh, preferably with both pre-emergent and post-emergent aspects to the program is important. Uh, with glyphosate specifically, not cutting the rates is, is a really important uh, practice for minimizing non-target site resistance, so no chemical mowing. I think we've, we've gotten away from that in the last few years. Um, those, those herbicides are also not very expensive, so there's, there's a much less of an economic incentive to shave the rate. Um, making sure we've got overlapping spectrums in our tank, mix, uh, our tank mixes, and then doing a good job of, of treating, so treating at the appropriate growth stage, good sprayer calibration, you know, make good applications is, is also really important here to avoid those sublethal doses. And then wherever it's feasible to in, include also non-chemical non practices that could be cultivation, mowing operations, or, or hand, hand weeding if, if appropriate. So, Management of resistant weeds in orchards, you know, we've got a number of post-emergent activities, particularly in tree nuts. Now, as you get into some of the smaller acreage crop, we have uh, sometimes a, a little bit more limited palette of tools. But we've got some good post-emergent programs with different modes of action, so they can be incorporated into many of our situations. Um, I'm a big advocate for pre-emergent herbicide programs uh, because we've got um, a, a longer duration of weed control, and we've got a number of different modes of actions compared to, compared to our post-emergent programs where we've got a, a much more limited number of modes of action. On some of our species, I think uh, middles management might be part of our, 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 something we should be thinking about, mostly because we're, we're really thinking about seed bank reductions. Uh, this is a, a slide I put together thinking more specifically about three spike goosegrass, but I believe that's also true for some of our other problematic species as well. So I'm not gonna belabor this too much, um, but I'll, I'll just put this out. Um, this is a herbicide registration kind of cheat sheet that I put together and try to keep updated every, every year or as I get new information. Uh, you can find this on the Weed Research and Information Center, but it, it's what, I, what I'm trying to do here with this more recent versions, this uh, site of action or this colored column is uh, sharing information about the mode of action. So if you're thinking about creating tank mix partners, uh, tank mix programs or sequential programs in the orchard system, and you wanna be able to kind of have, have a quick reference to what the mode of action is, uh, this could be a, a useful resource. And they're broken down by the pre-emergent materials, which is the upper part of this figure. The midsection is the post-emergent materials. And then that lower set of four is the organically uh, certified products. All four of those are post-emergent materials. I'm not going to present too much data here, but I, I wanted to make a point about, um, reiterate my point about pre-emergent materials. Uh, this was a, a site in Tulare County. D these are data from a site, a walnut orchard site in Tulare County that had a pretty uh, heavy population of glyphosate resistant hairy fleabane, a very very good, quote unquote, good population of glyphosate resistant jungle rice and a scattering of glyphosate resistant Palmer amaranth. And, and what I take home from this is some of our pre-emergent programs, um, this uh, uh, Allion and Matrix is, is a very common program. Uh, Allion Complete is basically the same treatment. This was a experimental formula, premix formulation. So we've got a couple of different modes of action in that site and we did a very good job on all three of these uh, tough species. Um, let's see. This, yeah, and, and this also, you know, similarly, Mission Allion, we had a sulfonylurea and a, a cellulose biosynthesis inhibitor, giving us good uh, broad spectrum control 
and a good duration of control reaching out into midsummer in, in uh, at 167 days, this would be probably um, end of July. So this, I'm not saying this is the best program in every every situation, but using strategies like this, uh, multiple modes of action, uh, effective rates applied at a good time for the weed spectrum in the field can be very effective. Uh, this is a, a similar, um, well, a little bit different tactic. This was some data um, we put together looking at sequential programs, uh, specifically targeting summer grasses, jungle rice uh, more specifically. What we did in each of these is I had a base program, that's the far left bar in each one, uh, Allion, Pindar GT, and uh, Tuscany, which is a flumioxazin product. What I did was add penamethylin in a sequential program. And I won't, I don't wanna belabor these too much, but what I wanted to make the point was using, in this case, the blue line, or the blue circle uh, circles, uh, a two quart prowl or penamethylin that was applied in March. Let's see. In, in March versus four quarts of that same product applied in the winter time. And my point here is thinking about when the weeds are a problem and, and looking at the best tools and the best way to use those tools. In this particular case, in, with each of those base programs, we got as good a control or better with half the amount of herbicide just by applying it at a more effective time of the year relative to the emergence of that species. And again, this isn't this isn't a cure-all program, but I think it's really important as weed managers, as pest control advisors, to think about the tools, to think about the species and, and the situation, and figure out how to use those best to get good weed control, um, get you know, be economical, and also reduce the amount of pesticide going into the environment. So integrated weed management. Um, you can, you can read these faster than I can, but field scouting and knowing what your problem is, is really important. So, so knowing, knowing the problem in your field, identifying those problems when they're small, um, whether they're new invasions or they're resistant biotypes, um, we can do intense management on a smaller portion of the orchard or vineyard rather than let it get everywhere and have to control, you know, control it once the, the horse is out of the barn, so to speak. Um, avoiding ineffective treatments, using the wrong tool or applying it poorly will waste time and money and give you unsatisfactory results and probably contribute to resistance. Um, on the other hand, I think avoiding overtreatment, this isn't so much a resistance issue, this is more of a good stewardship issue, but just because you can't afford it, I don't think means you should afford those extra treatments. In, you know, use them if they're necessary, don't use them if they're not necessary. Um, because of the economics, the environmental load and regulatory burden, as well as crop safety concerns. So as I wrap up, I'd like to just to make the point here, you know, all weed management choices, including doing nothing, have consequences that could be uh, related to efficacy, but also to resistance management. Um, herbicides are certainly effective tools that can provide good weed control. They shouldn't be the only tools considered, and particularly in light of resistance, we should be thinking about how to use those most effectively to give us weed control, but not well, but still minimize our, our um, herbicide resistance issues. I see herbicides are, are best used as part of an integrated plan that really con considers the situation and recognizes the trade-offs and opportunities available. I think this is my last poll question, Cheryl. So. The question is, which of these is an, an important component of an integrated weed management or integrated pest management for orchard weed control? Field scouting and record keeping, eliminating all pesticide use, cutting herbicide rates to a minimum, use, or using multiple tactics to reduce seed production of undesired weedy vegetation. And it looks like for this question, you can select more than one answer if you want to. Okay. so. I think most everybody got this right. I think field scouting and record keeping is really important part of it, uh, IPM or IWM. And really thinking about reducing seed production is, is the ultimate ultimate goal here to, to foster long-term weed management and resistance management uh, more specifically. I wanna skip through a couple here because I'm, I'm reaching the end of my time. There's been uh, a lot of people using the, not so much in the recent uh, uh, year or so, but for a while, super weeds were, was the, the topic that the 
the media really liked. And I think this is really a misnomer. I mean, are these super weeds? I don't think so. Are they a management challenge? Definitely, yes. These are, are not necessarily weeds that are more weedy or more prolific. They're just ones that can't be controlled with our, our control tactic, our, our, our cheap and easy control tactics. We need to do a better job. And I like this PCA quote from a number of years ago. I, I paraphrase him. He said, my job is, to, I'm trying to convince my growers that the days of $10 an acre weed control are over. And I think this is very much true. You know, it was, this was basically thinking about the glyphosate only programs. And we've got to be, you know, it, it's not going to be as easy going forward because of glyphosate resistance. I think this is my last poll question. We'll hit that one. And the question is, the best approach for reducing problems with herbicide resistant weeds in the orchard or in the orchard cropping system is a, to find an effective herbicide program and stick with it. True or false? Okay, that's, you guys are mostly got that. I, I would, I make this point often in my presentations that um, this is false. Um, I think it's really important to make some, you know, shifting, um, shifting the weed control programs uh, among modes of action and, and, you know, base programs is really important way to reduce the selection pressure. So just because something is working currently, I wouldn't stick with that for the foreseeable future because you'll, you'll essentially, eventually you'll find a species or a biotype that can survive that. So you wanna kind of keep, keep a, a lack of stability in the weed um, management program. Okay, I'm gonna just move through these last couple of slides for, for a few more or, uh, sources of information. Um, uh, several of us in the UCA and R put together some uh, integrated pest management publications about resistance a few years ago. We did some workshops in, in California, Oregon, and Washington. And a lot, of, a lot of what I talked about in terms of selection pressure is encompassed in one of those. And there's one specifically focused on uh, orchard and vineyard systems. So if you go to the uh, UC a &R catalog, you can find these if you're interested, or you'll probably find these on the uh, Weed Science blog or other online sources. Uh, there was a, um, a, a number of years ago as well, there was a, a California agriculture issue uh, that was focused on um, problems in California crops. And we had a, a, a an article that encompassed the herbicide resistance issues in in uh, several of uh, California's production systems, including like this ryegrass work that uh, Dr. Jasniak and, and uh, uh, her graduate student are working on in that cover shot. And then this is uh, weedscience.org. This is the uh, Ian Heap website that I pulled some of those figures from about worldwide cases of resistance. With that, I'll, I'll leave my contact information. And if there are any questions, I apologize for going over my time, but if there are any questions, I'm happy to, to stick around and, and uh, do my best to address those. The first question is from Ben, and it's, uh, what about heavily mulching? So have, heavily mulching, so uh, uh, I'm gonna assume that question is about using mulch as, as a weed control tactic. And certainly mulch, a thick layer of mulch can work in an orchard or vineyard just like it does in a landscape situation. Um, if it's an organic mulch, it will take maintenance. Um, so, so that's certainly a very viable way to reduce the dependence on herbicides, which would reduce the selection pressure for herbicide resistant weeds. Um, so that the physical barrier of an, of an organic uh, uh, type of mulch can very much reduce weeds. Um, it can be difficult to do that at scale in orchards and vineyards um, because of the volume of mulch, but it, it, if it's feasible in your situation, mulch can give you quite good weed suppression. Okay, and then the next one is, if glyphosate is banned, are there good alternatives? Yeah, I was waiting for the glyphosate question. Um, glyphosate is a really important tool. Um, in, in as you saw the, the data from the tree nut system, that's true across all the crops. Um, it works on a lot of different species, you know, grasses and broadleaves. It's translocated, so it can be more forgiving of size of plants. If glyphosate were not available or if you chose not to use it in your system, there's not a single tool that would do all of those that, that would do everything um, that glyphosate does. So, you know, you definitely could manage weeds without glyphosate, but um, it would take more management. It would probably take more uh, operations or more, more applications if it's herbicide-based, just because we don't have a single drop-in replacement for, for glyphosate. 
can be done, but not easily. So I guess, given that we're, we're not getting any more questions, um, I think it's a good time to wrap up. Okay, well, thank you everyone for, your, for listening in on this and, and I hope to see you in person sometime. Thank you. Thank you, Brad.